Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Harry Whitman. Hi, and welcome to the step-by-step -step guide on how not to offend anyone. It is important to remember before we start that not offending someone is nearly impossible, but it is required, so let's get started. Step number one is to greet the other person with kindness. This can be done with a simple handshake, but never assume they have hands. Do they have hands? Excellent. We must also never assume that they want to engage in physical hand contact. Simply ask permission to temporarily shake their palm and fingers. May I temporarily shake your palm and fingers? Yes, yes you may. Congratulations, you just completed step number one. <laughs> nice. And you just messed it up because you held their hand too long. Oops. Step number two, engage in conversation. The key here is to never bring up controversial topics. Would you like to hear about my political and or religious views? Easy does it. Topics to avoid when doing your best to not defend someone are religious views, political stances, financial decisions, workplace situations, weather forecasts, housing development, media coverage, medical issues, artificial intelligence, motion sensors, breakfast foods, footwear migration, theme parks, moisturizing cream, lemon peel, spoiled milk, spoiled children, and anything related to anything we see, hear, or feel. So how much did you pay for your house? Nope, shouldn't ask that. How dare you? Sorry. Step number three, eye contact. They say the eyes are the window to the soul, and windows are good, so let's use them. Make sure to keep strong, uninterrupted eye contact with the other person. Make sure the eyes are wide and open, but not too wide and open. You don't want to send the wrong message, but also not so squinted that it looks as if you're angry, because if you're angry, that'll anger them, causing them to be offended. If you sense the prolonged eye contact is causing them uncomfortability, then redirect your eyes immediately, but not too fast, you might scare them. And you know the saying, when we scare, we offend, and to offend is a dead end. And lastly, step number four, change your personality. Maybe we'll watch this a little bit later. We live in a culture of offended people. How many of you felt offended by somebody this week? I see a lot of heads nodding and not enough hands raised. It's one of those times where it's like, pastor knows what's going on. We live in such a society that goes to rage and anger so easily. It can be the smallest things. It can be someone brings up a subject that we disagree with them about. Uh, it, it can be just um, money, looks. Uh, we fight about what's going on in the world. We have a, a society that just struggles with communication. And more and more, this, this is a funny version of that, but more and more, uh, that, it's becoming more and more serious. I mean, I, it's only been two and a half years ago, and can you guys remember going through COVID, isolating in homes, and the only way we were really able to talk to each other is through television screens? That was hard, and that was aggravating. And there was a lot of people that disagreed with it, and rage tweeted about it, raged on Facebook about it. And we kind of eventually, we managed to get out of COVID and we moved into just a really difficult election season on both sides. I think all of us in this room would agree that we got really tired of the amount of posts and letters and, and pictures of just hateful rhetoric between the two political parties. And that's still kind of still goes on, but we have those kinds of things. So we have people that are still angry about COVID kinds of stuff. We have people that are still angry about the stuff that's been going on in our government. And then you have like the war in Ukraine and whose fault is that? You have raising ga gas prices. You have raising food um, and, and supplies, money, budget stuff. Uh, you have issues with people not being able to build houses anymore. Uh, and we have like maybe a recession right around the corner. We're all a little bit on edge. And the way the culture has taught us to kind of hit that release valve is to just let it go, to just, even just jokingly, just let some of it out, especially on things like Facebook and Instagram. I don't know about you, but there's been things I've posted on Facebook and Instagram that I would never say to another person. We begin to outrage on Facebook and Instagram. We see something we don't like, so we comment on it, and, and we make an argument with someone about that subject. Or maybe if we just disagree with them some, but we're not brave enough to say something exactly, we just retweet someone else. It's a bad cycle we have going on, just slowly decaying the relationships that we have among us. 
John Tyson is a pastor in uh, New York City, and he has this to say about the environment. Deep in our hearts, we feel sick about the hostility, dishonor, and disdain in our world. A kind of collective fatigue manifests itself in our disgust of our culture. We are exhausted by the devaluing of others, but feel powerless to stop it. I feel at times, after I am doing social media, there is so much condescension and so much anger, I am both grieved and overwhelmed. I lash out, but I don't exactly know how. We don't know how to change the channel of our contempt. Unity feels like a pipe dream and healing it feels out of reach. Our hearts are gr- grieved by the failure of the church as well. The wall we devalue people for their theology or lack there of it. Different practices and traditions, and we struggle with sin. Our vision of God has been lowered. His power is scarce, and his love is a rumor that has been chased away. John Tyson is, is calling out what he's seeing in people in the world that we live in. He's calling out the, the attitude, attitudes and desires of the people that he sees around them. Calling out people for uh, taking their rage and sadness, and sometimes it's justified, about the brokenness of our world. And we choose ways of expressing it that just cause more harm than good. I use Facebook and Instagram a lot just because it's easy for all of us to do it and we all do it. I'm sure in the last 24 hours you sat on your phone and flipped through whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, flipped through and you were offended by something and you had to sit and watch it. And it probably didn't cause you to feel positive feelings in that moment. There's something that happens in your brain where you want to stay on the app longer just to see more of that kind of stuff. So you can talk about how dumb those people are. It's a division tactic. That's just one of the ways that, and the main way that our culture deals with emotions. Uh, The other way would be uh, with our emotions, we tend to bury them down when we have uh, angry emotions. A friend of yours, or maybe it's a family member, says something to you, and in that moment, instead of confronting them and having a little bit of a difficult conversation for a moment, you instead bury it down and then wait a few weeks, and that argument becomes an argument about the dishes, um, which could have been way smaller, but now it's actually about the dishes and the car, and the amount of money you've spent. We need better ways of dealing with our emotions, folks. We need better ways of dealing with hard uh, anger, outrage, of, of, of grief, is what I'm going to call it. We need better practices for dealing with grief. And so I would ask, does the Bible say anything about handling grief? Does it give us a practice to be able to do in order to move our grief out of grief and into hope? Anybody think there is? Yeah, only a couple of people have hope. There is, promise, there is one. <laughs> uh, today, we are going to be talking about lament. Uh, lament, it's, uh, if you look at the dictionary, it is to feel or express sorrow or to mourn. See, lament is this practice where we go before God with our feelings of, of what is going on in the world around us. We go to him, we're honest with him, and through a process, he carries us through the, our deep, dark emotions into hope. We'll look at a a lament together to see that process. But this is God's chosen way to deal with when we have deep, hard emotions. And there are lies out there in the culture of different ways of dealing with hard emotions. Again, we kind of talked about, there's lies in culture that say, you know, just, just stuff them down. Just stuff them down. Like if you're angry, you know, you just need to get rid of that anger. We all know that anger eventually shows up somewhere else. 
Lamenting allows us to have a God-ordained way to deal with our emotions. So we're going to be going to the book of Lamentations. Surprise, surprise, Lamentations gets its name from the word lament. It's Lamentations 3. A little background on Lamentations. It is a book of laments written by an author that we do not know. Now this book is written by a group of people that are incredibly sad. Uh, If you've traveled through the story of the Bible with us, you know that eventually God's people in Israel move away from relationship with God, so God hands them over to judgment by the Babylonians and are taken away in exile. And so this story is the expression, this, these poetries are the, the songs that those exiles would sing as they're leaving their home to live in a faraway land. We're going to break up this lament to see how this Israelite processed his deep emotions about being exiled from his home. So, We'll go to uh, Lamentations 3, 19. Everything before 19, you're welcome to read up until there, but it is all dark and depressing. It's all things like, I am depressed, I am sad, I am ground into the ground, my teeth have been bitten by a bear. Like there's just, some of them are a little bit odd. <laughs> so, but um, the first 19 verses are really sad and dark. And so in In verse 19, the writer says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Does anyone see what the writer's doing in the front there? That first two verses, and then the verses before it, are all the writer of this being honest with God about their feelings. The first step in lament is to go before God and express how you are feeling. Not how you should feel, not what's appropriate to feel, but going to God with what you are feeling and just being honest with him about it. Protest the stuff going on in your life. If you can't afford groceries, go before him and say, God, I can't afford groceries. This stink. If you have a sick family member, you go before God and say, God, I have a sick family member over here, and I am mad about that. Someone hit my car this morning, God. That sucks. The first step of a lament is to take kind of the religiosity out of our feelings The idea that there's good emotions and bad emotions and you can't express emotions to God because, you know, he couldn't carry them, he couldn't understand them. We kind of have that, like, Judge Judy version of God when we have emotions, looking at her being like, well, I hope she doesn't get too mad at me as I express my emotions. No, God's able to take it. He's really dad sitting at the dining room table. You're sitting at him and you're yelling at him about what's unfair. Verses 21 through 24. Yet, this I call to mind, and and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. But they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. I wait for him. Step two of this guy's lament. He's honest with God about how he... Okay, real quick. I'm not the usual speaker, and I'm terrible with PowerPoints. So, real quick. If you notice PowerPoint that's like he's getting ahead, it's an accident. I'm not trying to give you spoilers or something. Uh, (laughs) Just pointing it out. There's a couple of people grading me in the audience. You don't have to grade me for that. So just so you know, people grading me for this one, okay? That was in the book to do. So back to the verse. Uh, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. 
for his compassion never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait. Out of telling God exactly what is going on and being honest with God about the situation that he's in, about saying, God, it is so unfair that these armies have come in to your chosen people, have killed many, have captured us as slaves, and are dragging us away. God, that is so unfair. But... I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. You see, step two to lament is to know God. Step two to lament is to know who God is, who God truly is. Notice a couple people that the writer of this does not say you should place your hope in. The writer of the lament doesn't complain about, about his, his exile and his hardship, his sickness, how dark his life is and evil. He is afflicted. He doesn't go to political systems for hope. He doesn't go to a political system that's broken for hope. He knows that power or influence, money, isn't going to help him out. And leaders aren't as well. This is kind of a side point, but as we are talking about lamenting, as you're beginning to decide, what am I going to place my hope in? to get me out of my negativity. These three things are terrible ways of getting you from grief to hope. Political systems, not even the right one in power, is going to carry you completely. It's broken. It's made by man. Power and influence can build you a nice little kingdom, but it'll be your own. And it will eventually fall. And then leaders, whether those are bosses or pastors or, or men and women you look up to in your life, to lament does not mean putting your faith in those people. Lamenting is placing faith in God alone. You see, God's character is the ultimate place the biblical writers find their hope. They do this because they understand deeply who God is. When I know someone, it's easier for me to place my hope in them, right? So when my father-in-law invites me to go drive across country with him, I'm going to say probably no thank you. Wonderful guy, but I don't know him real well. (laughs) I'm not very comfortable with that. Now my best friend asked me if I want to go across country. I'm a little bit more into that. I have hope we can get there because I know who he is. We're able to move from grief to hope based on the character of an individual. And for the Christian, this is based on God's. John Mark Comer has a quote where he talks about how to the scripture writers, hope is the absolute expectation of coming good based on the character of God. When you go and you get to know God, you will not be able to help but have hope. We could teach, honestly, a sermon series on what the character of God is, but there is one place in scripture that has a description of God's character. And we're going to look at that real fast. We're going to fly by it, take a picture of it, make some notes real quick. I underlined and even highlighted the main words. But if you were to go to God and say, hey God, how would you describe yourself? God would describe himself in Exodus 34, 
the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him, this is Moses, and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. You see, even though the biblical writer, even though the guy writing the lament is in chains being carried away from his home, he doesn't have some kind of like abstract faith in God. It's not like a God he had heard about in Sunday school or like, you know, God might be there and I might go pray to him. The writer knew who God was and had the, believed these things about God. He believed that God was compassionate about his circumstance. He believed that, that God had abounding love to him and was slow to anger and he would be faithful to him. A knowledge of God allows us to move from grief to hope. But what do we do with that? It's easy for me to stand here and say, yeah, you just need to know God and you'll have hope. And you're looking at me with like, I feel like I know God. I feel like maybe I can read those and I can maybe even have some of those memorized, but my heart doesn't believe you. Just honestly, my heart doesn't believe you. Like I I still have anger and I don't have hope. Move on to the next verse. It's 26, Lamentations 3, 26. It is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. The writer of Lamentations, the the lament writer, understood that he would take he would take the weight of his emotions, an honest version of his emotions, and he would take it to God. And he would be angry with God, he would yell at God, he would call God names, but the idea is, is he was going to God with honest emotions. But because the writer knows who God is, knows his character, he knows that that man can change his life, can bring heaven to earth, can heal him. And so because that man knows who the God is that he's approached, he is able to have hope. Now, our outward sign of hope is to wait. Now, this wait is not like a boring wait. It's not like waiting for an airplane or waiting for your spouse or girlfriend to stop getting ready so that you can get to dinner you were supposed to be at five minutes ago. Um, This wait is an active hope. In fact, The word in Hebrew is yakel, which actually means to wait. Hoping and waiting have the same word happening. In the Hebrew Bible, if you could not wait, you could not hope. And so for that writer moving from, for that writer moving from grief into hope, He needed to know two things. He needed to know who God was, and then he needed to be able to sit and wait on God. That's the lament process right there. That is the lament process that's shown, and I invite you to join into it. It's really easy. It's just being honest with God with your emotions and going to him. You guys don't have to be scared. There's for some reason, like in our churches, a belief that God's going to get angry or offended by your emotions. God is not going to get angry or offended by your emotions. Parents that have been in the room for five minutes, when your kid says that they're mad, does that break relationship? No. That's what kids do. 
This is a healthy version of taking the rage and sorrow that builds up, and you're able to take these things to God instead of social media or other people or even internalize. We hand these things to God, and you know what God does with them? He transforms them for good. You become a person that's hopeful and waiting, and you can see the good that's going to come out of things. But, as we're talking, I know that some of you aren't 100% bought in. I've been talking about a spiritual exercise, and when I said spiritual exercise, your eyes turned off. You're like, this sounds boring, too advanced for me. It's not. It's not. You can do this. But there are some challenges to us being able to lament. I don't think lament comes naturally to our culture. We actually have to work on it a little bit. And I think there's really kind of... Um, oh, that's the, I missed that slide, but you can see feelings, no God, hope, wait, that's the process. <clears throat> Take your feelings, no God, hope, and then wait. So here's the reasons that I think that uh, you would not be able to lament these days. Barriers to lament. First is a lack of delayed gratification. Uh, delayed gratification is just uh, is just defined as a resistance to temptation uh, for an immediate pleasure in the hopes of a later pleasure. We all know immediate gratification, right? Yep. Oh, come on. Who today had to practice waiting? Did anybody this week? For example, you go to the grocery store and your wife sends you to, to go get like a bag of chips or maybe, maybe cookies, if she's a really good wife. <laughs> and you're in high V, and high V's these days, they're smart. They got all the good stuff on all the aisles. So like you're fighting the enemy all the way through the store, praying prayers of protection over your eyes. And then you see it sitting there in the middle, middle of the aisle. It's a brand new, doesn't have to be cold, edible cookie dough. Guys, edible cookie dough. It's a big deal. So uh, I had to practice delayed gratification to have that uh, edible cookie dough till later. We struggle with being able to lament because we struggle with delayed gratification. One of the requirements for, uh, for being able to lament is to be able to wait on God and move. And when we live in a culture that cannot wait, we are not able to wait on God. We also struggle with the knowledge of self. Uh, we live in a society that does not know themselves well. Where do we get our best definition of who we are? God. Otherwise, the world around us begins to tell us who exactly we are. We listen to people like the self-help portion of the Amazon bookstore. We listen to Disney. They continually tell you over and over again, hey, you work hard enough, you got this. You want it, work hard of it, struggle, grind, whatever it is. You can be a millionaire by 32. Like, whatever it is you want, you go for it. You can bring heaven on earth. Guys, that is a lie. And as long as we believe that, our hearts are going to get broken over and over again. Only one man was able to bring heaven on earth. That was Jesus Christ. The final thing is we have a lack of knowing who God is. If a part of lamenting is knowing the characteristics of God, there's, a, there's the fact that in our culture we don't know God very well. Biblical literacy right now, I don't mean to be like an alarmist, but biblical literacy, the knowledge of God that people have right now is super low. When asked in churches how many people pray, how many people read their Bibles on a daily basis, 8% of Christians, kind of the Christian basics, can you pray and, and read your Bible? Just a couple things to get to know God. Not even long times of reading Bible, not long prayers, but just do it. It was only 8% of Christians. We have a next generation coming up, guys, Generation Z, and I'm excited for a lot of what Gen Z is about, but like 
they are a generation that does not struggle with the prosperity gospel. They're not interested in that. They're not like, get me money and stuff. They they are actually like going into this gospel of purpose where I'm worried for them because they believe this gospel of like, hey, you are special and it's going to be you that's going to save the world. And they're going out and trying to save the world And they're going to encounter the same things we do. And it's all because they have a lack of knowing who they are and who God is. When we can develop some delayed gratification, when we know healthily ourselves, when we know God, we can begin to lament. So why do we have hope to lament? Well, it's the gospel. The gospel is the reason we're able to lament, guys. There's no situation in your life that you are not able to lament about and then have hope. You can look at my kind of fun drawing I did. I don't know if it's very good, but we're going to walk through the gospel super fast so that I can help remind you, if you don't know this week, why you're able to lament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created you, and he called you good. He created you for relationship and to be in a relationship in which you would work with him in the garden and be co-rulers over creation. But in Genesis 3, we rebelled. And in our rebellion, creation was bent. Sin and evil entered the world. And we hated it. And so as people, we continued to try and and fix things over and over again. We would take the things that were broken, and in our brokenness, we would continue to try fixing broken things. But there was never any way that we were going to be able to fix the bent things, never be able to, to defeat death itself. And so Jesus, the only one that could, died for you and I to rescue, redeem, and restore us back into relationship with God to give us life, to allow us to be able to do good works, so the, to, to be able to have a relationship with God. So in your dark moments that are in your life right now, moments that feel bigger than you are, if you have depression, if you have anger, sadness, despair about anything going on in your life, you can go back and you can look at this gospel hope and say, you know what? I know that God is ultimately bringing life. I know God is ultimately bringing love and good works, even through this process. Amen. Amen. Now, tonight, or this morning, guys, what are you going to do next? You got three options. The first one is if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, as your rescuer, You need to stop what you're doing, turn to him, and accept his gift of salvation, of being rescued. Maybe you've done that. But maybe you've done that, and you're still doing the things you want to do on a daily basis, and you still see bent brokenness in your life. In that case, you need to go to Jesus as king. You need to submit your life to him. You need to listen to what he would have you do, and you need to begin practicing his ways. And then if you have some hard, deep, dark emotions that you're dealing with, if you feel like you have things to lament, then do it here. Feel those feelings. Say them to God. Hope. Wait for him here. We're going to enter into a time of communion now. I'm going to ask my ushers to come forward in prayers. And as we enter into this time of communion, I want you to think about where you're at in the story of lamenting. Do you need Jesus to rescue you? Are you rescued? And do you just need to submit to Jesus as king and practice his ways? Or do you have a deep emotion that you need to lament to him for? And if it's not those, the other thing I have for you to meditate on, meditate on also this community. Communion is such a cool activity because it's one of the Christian um, sacraments that reminds us that we can never be Christian alone. You can't take communion by yourself.